champagne glasses. I am not having champagne um, and I'm not actually going to do a cocktail live on the, out, on the air because I'm in my little fireside chat area. <laughs> I decided I wanted to be comfy and cozy for New Year's Eve. So I did. I have my um, it's actually Chad's uh, U.S. Constitution old fashioned glass. <laughs> And it's got vanilla fig, bourbon, and ginger ale in it. And it's actually pretty fabulous. I made the vanilla fig bourbon kind of a while ago. I don't remember exactly when. Um, same time I made, uh, wow, I'm totally blanking. Second horse punch, I think. And I just, I had a bunch of figs, dried figs that I wasn't going to use. So I put them in a quart jar and I filled the quart jar with bourbon. I didn't put any sugar in because, you know, dried fruit's pretty sweet. Um, and it got kind of syrupy and dark and delicious. And I just put a little ginger ale in it. And it's kind of wonderful. It tastes a lot like dried figs, which is great. Hi, Glenn and Carla. What kind of pie did you have? haven't really had any dessert. Um, I made some kind of disappointing eggnog custard the other day uh, that improved with being in the fridge, so I had some of that this afternoon. Oh, Heather is having scotch. Uh-oh. I hope it kills whatever you might have. She probably have a Guinness, though. Get those calories and minerals in you. So anyway, I don't have a ton planned for tonight. I thought we could just hang out and wait for midnight together. Um, what I did today is uh, I wrote very belated Christmas cards, <laughs> including to food historian members and patrons. You guys are going in the mail tomorrow, so you should be getting those soon. Um, and that's pretty much it. It's been a lazy couple of days. Oh yes! Okay, Glenn and Carla had Hubbard squash pie because their grocery store sent them a Hubbard squash for Thanksgiving by mistake. <laughs> Good use. I made rice pudding again because um, we actually didn't have Christmas uh, yet. We're going to have it tomorrow because um, we had a COVID scare in our little family that turned out thankfully to be negative. Got the results yesterday. So we're going to go see my mom-in-law and have Christmas on New Year's Day. <laughs> the car is already full of presents. Our little tree is looking kind of lonely now. There's still a couple presents for friends there, but... That's pretty much it. I have to tell you guys also, I tried to look up some of the history of New Year's Eve parties, and it's all very murky and vague. You know, like, the closest we had was history of the ball drop, which was apparently because um, when you try to have fireworks in downtown Manhattan, all the hot ash falls on everyone. 
So the ball drop was it 1908, 1906, somewhere in there. Uh, they started that as an alternative to fireworks. So, oh yes, Carla says, tell us about your office updates. All right, so I've been working from home largely uh, since March. Um, I still go into work, you know, one or two days a week, depending. Um, but I have a little upstairs guest bedroom. That's also my cookbook library. You know, that's where I do most of the food history happy hours from. And I got some money for Christmas. So I splurged and bought three more bookshelves that match my existing bookshelves. And I'm going to have like a whole wall. They just fit. I have a whole wall of matching bookshelves. It's going to look like built in. It's going to be great. So I've been organizing my cookbook library. I also ordered some acid-free boxes, like little photo boxes that just fit perfectly on the shelf um, for all my cookbooklets because it's really hard when they were just on the shelf to see what they were, but I figure if they're in this nice box, I can kind of flip through them and see, and so those are all going to be organized by date, but apparently I have a lot of cookbooklets from the 1940s, so I had to order some more boxes. <laughs> and I moved my desk, and I'm maybe gonna get myself a little comfy chair up there, because I have some more room, because of how I rearranged, um, which you'll probably see for the next Food History Happy Hour, which is, I think, January... 16th, I think I scheduled it for. 15th. January 15th. Hi, Maggie! Happy New Year! Yeah, so hopefully by then all my shelves will be put together because I have to build them. And uh, the books will be organized. Um, one of my long-term goals that I've had for a while and I haven't really had a lot of time to make headway on is to catalog my cookbook library because it's a little intense, you guys. It's gonna be, it's gonna be seven three shelf bookshelves worth. Not all that is cookbooks. There's, you know, probably a shelf, like a one bookcase at least of um, like academic food history books. Uh, but it's a lot, it's a lot of cookbooks. <laughs> And, you know, maybe someday I would get an intern that might want to come and catalog. Uh, but I'm going to try and do it myself. I have to figure out, um, I saw a really cute thing on a little vintage, like, housewares group that I'm in. This woman um, gets cardstock and she cuts it into strips and she puts it in the book. Like, nice long strips that goes all the way down to the bottom and she puts the year that it was published on top. And I think I'm going to try and do that to help me keep organized. Because right now, it's like if you take something off the shelf, they were in chronological order. <laughs> but I've been using a bunch of them. And uh, they don't always get put back in chronological order. So that's what's going on with my office. I'm pretty excited. I already ordered myself a little ottoman, like a little footstool. A teeny tiny one, like it's only a foot tall. Um, velvet, of course. And I might order a velvet chair. And I'm just really excited to have a little workspace that's organized and functional and looking forward to probably spending most of 2021 in there too. <laughs> So anyway, that's my office update. Thanks for asking, Carla. Uh, if you're just joining us, I'm drinking vanilla fig bourbon and ginger ale that I made myself. So I don't know, um, for those of you who are not on my mailing list, on my email list, and who haven't visited my blog, I... Uh, posted a retrospective this morning on the blog. Oh my gosh. Yes, Elizabeth. Velvet chairs. Very excited. Green. Green velvet. Not too big. Not too big. I'm like with a room under it so I can put the footstool under there because it's not a very big space, but I'm pretty excited. 
We'll see how it goes. I'm going to put the bookshelves up first, though, before I order it. Anyway, 2020 retrospective. So one of the themes of 2020 on the Food Historian blog um, was how similar the events of 2020 are to the events of, you know, 1918, 1919, 1920. So like 100 years later, all the stuff that we're still dealing with. Global pandemics, racial violence, uh, a government that favors large businesses over ordinary people, a post-war recession. <laughs> like, all of this stuff that was happening in from 1918 to, like, 1922 is still happening 100 years later. So, as a historian, you get to see a lot of those parallels. Uh, and for those of you who follow Heather Cox Richardson, like I do, she did a big retrospective post about why we are where we are in terms of political history. Um, if you like history, I recommend you check it out. Or even if you don't like history and you're interested in politics, you should check it out. She's a pretty brilliant political historian, especially in terms of translating pretty complex stuff for the average person and making all kinds of connections that people don't usually make. So that's my favorite. She's been like a beacon in the darkness posting every day, which I don't know how she does it, but she does. So we'll see what happens in 2021 if she keeps it up. Um, but hopefully things will start to improve. And yeah, 2021, it's like you don't want to jinx it, particularly when you have people doing stuff like intentionally destroying vaccines. Uh, yes, okay, yes, Elizabeth, okay, so yeah, Elizabeth's saying like all the bad stuff of the late teens and 20s uh, are repeating, but not the good stuff. Yes, yes, when it was New Year's Eve 2019. I was like, woo, we're going to be in the roaring 20s, and we're going to, let's bring back jazz and, you know, dancing and cool outfits and feminism, right? 1920 is when women get the right to vote. There's flappers, all kinds of fun stuff, like loosening social strictures. Yeah, instead we got all the other crap that was going on. Uh, okay, Carla says Heather Cox Richardson's going to keep posting at least through the first 100 days. And Glenn shared a link. Oh, I can't. Hold on. I have to open it in a new tab. Or it's going to close out the live stream. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Glenn. That's silly. It's a little Pixar meme. Um, so normally for New Year's Eve, my husband and I, uh, a couple of years ago, started a new family tradition. We like to do those. Our family tradition is, even though we both grew up with fake trees, um, our family tradition is a live tree. We go and get a live tree every year. Um, we didn't cut down our own this year because it was, like, wet and miserable and muddy. And that's no fun. It's more fun if it's snowy. Um... But our other New Year's Eve tradition, which we try and drag friends along with us with varying degrees of success, was that we would go up to Lake George, where there are a couple of steamboat companies, and one of them did a New Year's Eve dinner cruise with, like, live music, and we would get super dressed up, like, practically formal wear, or at least the ladies would, um, and go on this fun cruise and have dinner and cocktails and dance to live music and it was super fun being out on a boat and they didn't do it last year which was sad but I think they're going to do it again in the future so I look forward to that and I was looking through um, my Facebook memories as one does occasionally and I saw a memory from a couple years ago where we had gotten really dressed up and we were walking, like, through the hotel lobby to go to the car to get to the steamboat, right? And these little girls were, like, playing in the hallway. And I was really dressed up. And I have um, 
like my fancy coat is a vintage 1950s wool cape. <laughs> so I had my hair done up super fancy and I was wearing high heels and a, a floor length dress and this cape and I walk by and these little girls are like, like looking at us with awe. Me and my friends were all dressed up. So I was like, oh, I feel like a princess. And then uh, my husband went back in because I forgot something and he's in the elevator going up to our room and there's these little boys in there and they're like, are you coming to our New Year's Eve party? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to a different one, but my wife forgot something and I have to go back and get it. And the little boy said, is she one of the pretty ladies you were with? <laughs> Which just totally made my day. And so, yeah, I'm looking forward to being a pretty, pretty princess on New Year's Eve again in the future. Hopefully in 2021 we'll be able to steamboat it up, you guys. Do you guys have anything, any New Year's Eve traditions? There's a lot of food traditions around New Year's Eve. Um, I haven't done any of them, unless you count eating green food to bring you money. I had guacamole for dinner. <laughs> Homemade guac. I forgot I bought three avocados, so I made guacamole. Um, and I guess corn chips are gold, right? So that's supposed to bring you prosperity <laughs> in the new year. One of my friends, um, a couple of my friends actually shared a meme about Black Eyed Peas, and it was like, you forgot to eat these last year, don't forget this year, because of course, Black Eyed Peas, like, this is an old, old tradition dating back possibly to Roman times that legumes resemble coins, in the Roman era it would have been um, lentils, right, so that was supposed to bring you luck. Greens, collard greens are supposed to bring you luck, green vegetables, green foods, um, cornbread, other yellow things are supposed to be like gold, right? So there are a bunch of food traditions around what you eat on New Year's Day to ring in a prosperous and healthy New Year. Um, I didn't do any of them except for eat guacamole. So <laughs> we'll see what 2021 is like. Uh, but yeah. What are you guys doing? Are you eating any special foods? I've also, I saw a funny thing, um, and a bunch of my friends have posted about, at the stroke of midnight, you have to open up the door to the outside to let all the bad things of the previous year out and all the good things of the new year in. So I think that's something I might actually do this year. Um, also, bell ringing, pot banging, gun firing, don't recommend that one. Fireworks, loud things to scare away evil spirits. Right? We have certainly had a lot of those this year. <laughs> so, definitely going to open the door. Not so much about the loud noises, probably. I'd probably scare Sweetie Pie, who's currently, I think, asleep on the couch. But anyway. Well, I got no other history, you guys. What do you want to talk about? I'm going to hang out until midnight. And, uh, yeah. I did my her. <laughs> Glenn, you can count the black eyed peas in the soup you already finished. Yes. I'm pretty sure New Year's Eve counts toward the new year. Even if you consume it on New Year's Eve. We didn't really have a ton of New Year's Eve traditions, like, in my house, growing up, like, in our house, um, except for watching the ball drop and staying home, mostly. <laughs> um, but we did have, uh, which this is something I'm probably going to talk about a little bit at the next Food History Happy Hour, which is only in, like, two weeks. It's so crazy, you guys. Um, but we had a tradition with the Swedish Society called Sugar Dog Knut, or as my husband says, Sugary Dog Canoe, because he can't pronounce anything in Swedish, um, which is known as the 20th day of Knut, King Knut. It's the 20th day after Christmas, um, when basically the Swedes had to be told to stop partying. 
<laughs> Which should not come as a surprise. I wish we had 20 days of Christmas, you guys. Who, who needs 12 when you can have 20? Um, but that tradition is you take down all the decorations off the Christmas tree, which usually included candy, like little candy things. Um, you ate up all the leftover goodies from Christmas, all the leftover Christmas cookies. Uh, and then they made a big vat of split pea soup, which I totally have a ham in my fridge that I'm going to make split pea soup out of for Shane to Dog Knut. Uh, and then you dance around the Christmas tree and you sing songs, and then you take the Christmas tree once all the decorations are off, and you take it outside and you throw it in the snow. And that's the, how the Swedes do it. <laughs> Heather, yes, it's Schiegendag Knut, or Schiegendag Knut, which is t dog is day. Hugo is 20, so 20th day of Knut, King Knut. But, yeah, sugary dog Knut. <laughs> uh, oh, Heather's got a good question. What kinds of foods were served on New Year's Day in America in the 18th and 19th centuries? I was just reading an excerpt from an 1860s magazine where people were talking about suggested menus and complaining that their New Year's Day visitors only seemed to stay long enough to drink a glass of wine. Interesting. Yeah, um, aside from probably African Americans and enslaved people in the South <laughs> having collard greens and black eyed peas and cornbread um, to ring in the new year. Uh, I think in the 19th century, most of the foods were probably your kind of typical winter party foods. I think somebody posted a menu actually on Instagram. Hold on, let me see if I can bring it up. I haven't run across a ton of um, New Year's Eve specific menus and I'm kind of regretting now that <laughs> I didn't do this up in my in my library because I could have just grabbed some books and we could have looked. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Oh my gosh, I follow too many people on Instagram. <laughs> All right, well, anyway, I don't remember it being anything out of the ordinary in terms of 18th or 19th century foods, um, but it was specifically for New Year's Eve, but it was like a hotel or restaurant menu, and those don't tend to have a ton of variety, believe it or not. Um, you would think that they would have more specific foods for specific holidays, but it seems like it's just their general... Um, you know, here's fancy food recipes. <laughs> oh, why can't I find it, you guys? There's too many posts. All right. Well, I can't find it. I'm sorry. But that is, it's very interesting that you said that they only stay long enough to drink a glass of wine. So, like, were people, like, making the rounds? Is that what was going on? not staying long enough to actually eat food. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, Elizabeth, you do make a good point that Twelfth Night, for sure during the 18th century, Twelfth Night would have been a way more prominent holiday than New Year's Eve. Um, yeah. And so this is something in, it probably also depended on your culture background because, um, for instance, in Russia, uh, New Year's Eve is December 31st is a huge holiday because the uh, Russian Orthodox Church Christmas isn't until January 6th. Um, so New Year's Eve was like the big one then, of course, during the Soviet Union when religion was outlawed, essentially. Uh, New Year's Eve, uh, I think it's called Novi God, was kind of the analog for Christmas. Secular Christmas. Mm, Carla says, yeah, people are probably having open houses. Yeah, mm, can't do that this year, right? That might be by the wayside next year, too. We'll see. But yeah, I think a lot of the traditional 
New Year's Eve celebrations were, you know, either rolled into or kind of superseded by Twelfth Night. Um, by the time you get to the late 19th and early 20th century, they become more kind of public celebrations. Um, so, yeah, lots of fireworks going out making noise in the street. Private parties, kind of how we do it now, right? Restaurants, things like that. Um, that's why my, my little preliminary research that I did for tonight just to try and find if there's anything interesting was so disappointing because everybody said like the same really generic things about, you know, the shifting of the Roman calendar to the Julian calendar and, you know, all the same stuff about food. Oh, yeah, okay. So Carlos also mentioned Scotland and Hogmanay. Um, I think that's how it's pronounced. Which I hardly know anything about, and I should have researched before doing this. But like I said, spur of the moment. Um, Auld Lang Syne, actually, my husband and I were talking about that the other day, and we looked up. We're like, what does that actually mean? Um, and the it's like in the long ago or like days gone by stuff like that so um that's probably the most prominent association with new year's eve that comes from scotland is very specifically that song which the tune of which is quite ancient the words are a little bit um more recent like late 18th century um but yeah Oh, interesting. Elizabeth says the menu specified that it was only men who were paying the call, so the menu should be things that men like, like cold meat, sliced cake, different kinds of wine. And the men were competing to visit the most people within the same afternoon. Hmm. That's very interesting, particularly since it's usually women who are making afternoon social calls. Maybe in the 19th century, New Year's Eve was one of those things where it's like, Topsy turvy gender roles, right? Oh, yes, Heather, because of COVID, I'll miss out on the old Scottish New York Day tradition. New Year's Day, sorry, you put NY, that's New York to me. Um, New Year's Day tradition of first footing, taking a wee dram with you to be the first visitor to darken your friend's door. Oh. We'll have to just drink whiskey on my old. Old, my old Lang Syne is on the gramophone as we speak. Uh, Glenn says in Georgia, that's the country, not the state, parties run from New Calendar Christmas Eve through Old Calendar St. Nino's Day, um, January 14 through the 27th. Is that what that means? Um, yeah, Stringer Dog Knut is usually, um, I always forget the day because I never had to remember because the Swedish Society just had the party and I just went. Oh, let me look at the day here. Yes, Wednesday, January 13th is Huguenot Knut Day, also known as Saint Knut's Day. Anyway, celebrate it throughout Scandinavia. So, yeah, similar, similar. I wonder if the Georgians got it from the Vikings or something. <laughs> Not that the Vikings celebrated Christmas, but you know. Ugh, it's only 11.30, you guys. Feels like this year will never end. That's all right. Anything else you want to talk about? I didn't have anything planned, spur of the moment. I'm drinking uh, my fig, vanilla fig bourbon and ginger ale, which is quite delightful. Mmm, Carla brings up Santa Lucia. Or some people say uh, Santa Lucia, if you're um, Italian. That's actually before Christmas. That's December 13th. So in Scandinavia, the story is that um, 
So, of course, St. Lucie, Sancta Lucia, uh, was like an early Christian in pagan Rome. And her father, like, arranged a marriage with her to a pagan guy, and she didn't want to marry him because she was a Christian. And I don't remember the whole background, but eventually she ends up being martyred. Uh, I think they tear her eyes out, which is kind of horrible. Um, and she becomes a saint. And in, I believe, 17th century Scandinavia, it might be earlier than that, um, there was a famine in Sweden, and I think in Vermland, and uh, the people were starving, basically, and it's coming up on, you know, midwinter, and all of a sudden this boat arrives, and it's got this woman dressed in white, at the bow of the boat and she has a crown of light streaming from her head and the boat is full of food. And so the people of Vermland are saved by a woman who they think is Saint Lucy, Sancta Lucia. Uh, and so every year on December 13th, usually or thereabouts, um, there's Sancta Lucia's dog, which starts with, um, the young lady of the house, uh, or if it's in public, a young woman is elected, and she wears a white robe with a red sash and a crown of greenery. I don't remember if there's a specific type. Uh, and lit candles. And she prays through the house at the crack of dawn with lucicote, which is a type of saffron bun, and coffee, and wakes up the family. And in, in public, spaces this is like a parade usually and if there are other children um the boys are like star boys they wear like these pointed hats with stars on them and carry like little wands with stars and they wear white and then there's other like saint lucy's attendants who are little girls they wear white usually like silver tinsel on their head with a, holding a candle and i totally grew up doing that <laughs> again very active swedish society in Farka, north dakota um, and I, for a while, was the youngest Lucia ever because the college-age girl they had scheduled to come and be Lucia didn't show up when I was, like, 13, so I had to be, <laughs> I had to be Lucia, but then a couple of years ago, like, they only had little girls, so and even, I think she was, like, 12, she got to be Lucia, so... Um, now it's electric candles, thank goodness, uh, but they used to do real candles, and they'd put, like, a wet handkerchief on your head to catch any drips, um, but dripping hot wax on your head is not super comfortable, so <laughs> I'm glad it's electric now. Uh, so that's Santa Lucia's dog, but that's before Christmas. But if you're Scandinavian and you're celebrating from... December 13th all the way to January 13th. That's more than 20 days of celebrating. You should bring that back. Just everything shuts down. <laughs> From mid-December to mid-January, we just hang out and have fun and eat food. Oh, Jonelle, Happy New Year! Thanks for stopping in. <laughs> Jonelle says, I won't make it to midnight here in Nebraska. Well, that's the great thing about having your friend live on the East Coast is everybody in the rest of the country is earlier. So if you didn't want to stay up until midnight, you don't have to. I have been staying up way too late recently and then getting up way too late and it's awful and I need to stop. But um, I figure New Year's Eve will make an exception. I got to get up early so we can drive tomorrow. But... Uh, yeah, Elizabeth says, I think we should bring back the 12 Days of Christmas. So I was watching, I don't know if anybody has Amazon Prime. If you do, you should check out. They have um, Tudor Monastery Farm Christmas with my favorite domestic historian, Ruth Goodman. She's awesome. They've done a ton. I've talked, I think, before about Victorian Farm and Edwardian Farm and Wartime Farm and all those great things. So um, Amazon Prime has Tudor Monastery Farm. And she said something very interesting to me, which I didn't really connect the dots because again I'm not really a Tudor medieval historian I'm more of like late 18th century maybe 19th century 20th century um but she talked about how the Catholic calendar 
obviously in the medieval period there was a lot of feast days but there were also fast days and in the time leading up to the 12 days of christmas you fasted and you worked extra hard to get all of your work done including like getting lots of animal fodder and firewood and things like this already so that when it came to actual christmas um, you didn't have to do any hard labor and you could celebrate and feast and so fasting in the medieval Tudor period was not really fasting like we think of it today. It's not really not eating, but it was not eating meat and dairy <laughs> um, and fat, really. And they didn't really have huge access to sugar in that time period. So that was something that I thought we should maybe bring back because in the United States, uh, the period from like, Halloween until New Year's Eve is like one big binge basically of candy and then it's Thanksgiving and you stuff yourself sick at Thanksgiving and then all through December it's like Christmas parties and Christmas cookies and eating not good for you food. So I think we should bring back a little austerity early in December and then go all out for the 12 days of Christmas. We should definitely have the 12 days of Christmas off from work. That should be a thing. Um, even though I know technically it's a Christian holiday, uh, I think we should be allowed to have it off and get a real break in this country. Um, and then yeah, rest up before the new year. So I agree, Elizabeth. And I also agree that Ruth Goodman is amazing and that the BBC should just continue to give her her own show to do with as she pleases about domestic history through time. I would love that. <laughs> huh. All right, folks. We've got a ways to go still. <laughs> it's only 11.37. I don't know. Are we actually going to make it until midnight? I'm just going to keep hanging out. If you want to hang out with me, you can. I don't know what else to talk about. We kind of talked about a lot already. All right, I'm going to see if I can find this menu that we were talking about earlier. Because now I'm curious. Or I could just go upstairs and get a cookbook and come back down. I should just search, I think. Here we go. The Historical Menu Society. December 31st, 1909. Uh, yes, the San Francisco cafe menu, New Year's Eve menu, and it's literally like every other <laughs> turn of the 20th century menu. It's super French. So the menu is hors d'oeuvre varié. So like various hors d'oeuvres. Um, toque points mignonette, which I believe is a type of oyster. Uh, cream of chicken ren margot. Who knows what that is? With salted nuts and mixed olives. Uh, medallion striped bass joinville joinville I don't know uh, sweetbreads larded with glass toulouse and haricot vert green beans right I don't know what glazed toulouse is frozen eggnog oh that sounds really 21st century uh, roast breast of turkey with cranberry sauce chestnut stuffing and asparagus tip saute uh, and then celery with Roquefort cheese Parisienne. Souvenir ice cream? Does that mean that like, you get to take it home with you? Petit four. Café noir, black coffee, and pedophores. And souvenir ice cream either means um, an ice cream to remember or that you take it home with you. 
Um, so yeah, very typical restaurant food in the early 20th century. Very French, right? Because it's fancy. So yeah. Carla wants to know plans for 2021 Food History Happy Hour. So I have to tell you, many of you probably know this already, that Food History Happy Hour started on a total whim in the midst of a global pandemic when I was stuck at home and I was like, let's have a fun Facebook Live thing and I'll talk about food history with my friends. And for a while there, I was doing it every week, which was awesome, but a little much. <laughs> so now we're down to like once a month. This month you get a bonus one. You're welcome. Um, I will probably try to keep going in 2021 if people are still interested, if people want to keep watching. But I'm probably only going to do it once a month. Um, because especially as the vaccine starts to make its way through uh, the populace and things start to open back up a little bit more, um, people are probably going to want to spend less time in front of their computers. <laughs> probably not me, though, because I... I love being on my computer and reading cool stuff and doing research and writing when I can, because I think that's fun. So yeah, we'll keep going. We'll keep doing it. I do also have a ton of speaking engagements, like talks and stuff scheduled for early 2021 already. I think I've got like three or four in January. I have three or four in February, a couple in March. Um, and then one library I'm doing a cookbook club, which should be fun. We're going to do it um, quarterly, so four times a year, and we're going to select a cookbook, and then people can cook from it, you can read it, you can do whatever you want, and then we're going to chit chat about it on Zoom, which should be pretty fun. Uh, I'm also very proud, you guys, I, I invest a little time and a little bit of money in my website, so I've got it, the front page is much prettier now. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit easier to see what new blog posts are up and um, to see what events are coming up now on the website. It looks much prettier. So if you haven't gone and checked it out, you should. You, I, It's now in Google Calendar. You can add events to your Google Calendar if you want. Um, we're getting all fancy as we go along. So... I also have a couple of really cool blog posts that I'm going to publish uh, in the next couple of weeks, um, including one that involves the Trump family. So stay tuned for that one. I'm probably going to try and post that one on Inauguration Week. <laughs> and yes, it is food history related with the Trumps. So yeah, that's my plans. What else do you guys want to talk about? We have 17 minutes left of 2020. Anything you want to rant about? Anything you want to talk about before this crazy year is done? My fig vanilla bourbon ginger ale, um, has gotten kind of watery because my ice cubes have melted, but it still tastes good. I'm surprised at how much I like the fig bourbon. It's very nice. She waits awkwardly for questions. Comments? Personal anecdotes? Um, I don't know. What else am I working on? I'm not really working on anything. Um, other than my book, my poor little book, I revisited, uh, I had to write an abstract for something, so I revisited my book, and I am feeling pretty good about it, actually. I know what I have to do. It's just a matter of finding the time to do it. Like, I decided I really want to go to the National Archive in Philadelphia and look at the U.S. Food Administration records there. 
because I feel like I need to know that. They have the New York Food Administrator records there, so. One more thing to add to my list to do with the book, which I'll probably just end up making in another book at some point. But anyway. A couple of the programs coming up in January I'm doing cooking demos for, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Oh, interesting. Okay, Glenn has found um, a history of Advent calendars because Advent used to be about fasting, right? Leading up to Christmas, the 12 days of Christmas. Um, but now Advent calendars are all about candy. Oh, that's cute. So very early um, Advent calendars started in like turn of the 20th century in Germany but not with candy. Oh! Yeah, cool, okay. So he grew up, um, the guy who invented Edmund Calendar is basically Gerhard Long. Uh, Grew up with his mom making 24 vibes, a Swabian type of baked meringue, to make the time until Christmas Eve pass faster. Uh, so he's the one who invented the chocolate based advent calendar. Interesting, in 1908 ish, 8 ish, doesn't say exactly when. Cool. Wonder when it came to the U.S. Probably fairly early on. Anyway. Sorry, my wobbling my computer. <laughs> Alrighty, friends. We're getting there. We're going to get there. We're going to get there this year. And it'll be 2021. Sadly, probably not very much will change. At least not for several months. Because <laughs> that's the way of the world. Um, but hopefully by spring, the vaccine will be widely available. Hopefully people will actually take it. And we can start getting back to the point where we can actually see each other in person again. <laughs> Which would be nice. Although I like the virtual too because you can see people who are really far away. Um, I'm thinking back to when I was a kid and the internet was kind of new. I'm not that old, but you know, 1990s, right? And dial up internet and it would take like 45 minutes for a pixelated video <laughs> to load. And now we have live, fairly high quality video streaming. And it's a pretty amazing world that we live in. Oh, Carla wants to know where Chad is. Chad is camera shy, as you may have noticed. Um, he is in another room, virtually blowing stuff up, I think. Because <laughs> that's what he likes to do in his spare time. We did pack earlier for tomorrow, so. But yeah, normally, like I said, we'd be on a steamboat, all dressed up and dancing, but for home, he'd rather be in comfy clothes, which I can't say I blame him. <sighs> 11 minutes left, you guys. I will tell you the one thing that I'm probably looking forward to the most uh, once the pandemic is over is the return of swing dancing. Todd and I like to go swing dancing. We have a bunch of friends who like to go swing dancing. There's a brewery not too far from our house that once a month would have a swing dance with a live, like, 20-piece jazz band. So we'd get all dressed up and go swing dancing, and it was awesome. 
And the last time we did that was in the very beginning of March. Excuse me. Which, in retrospect, we probably shouldn't have done, but after dancing, I instantly washed my hands every time I danced with someone I didn't know because that was the conventional wisdom of the time. Um, and we haven't done it since, so that's something I really miss. This is probably the first time I've gotten this dressed up uh, since then, right? Because we haven't gone anywhere. We've been home. So that was one thing I always looked forward to was getting gussied, going out and having fun, dancing. Seems like so long ago, but it was really only nine months. But yeah, 2020, the year that never ends. That's the joke, right? Is we're going to get to 11.59 tonight, and then it's going to flip over to the next minute, and it's going to be 1,300. It's going to be December 32, 2020, right? The year that doesn't end. But it's going to end eventually. Now we're down to nine minutes. Does anybody have any last hurrahs. Ooh, Elizabeth says, I love swing dancing. It's kind of hard to find a place that has its events in Northern California. What? Hopefully these kind of events will be able to happen again. Yeah, I don't know what it is about that. So like New York City has a really big swing dance crowd and Albany has a really big swing dance crowd, but there's not really a super ton going on in between. Um, and this is a no cover live band swing dance, which is not common. There's some in Kingston, but that's like an hour from my house. That's where I work. Um, so it's nice to have one that's like 10 minutes from our house. And it's usually crowded. Crowded. Like, there's usually over 100 people for those swing dances, which is super fun. Dance floor gets a little crowded, though. Oh, yeah, Glenn says, still trying to figure out how my pancreas will make it through winter without a few contra dances. I've taken a few short chili bike rides. Yep, I've been on my elliptical a lot, and we've been walking Sweetie Pie around the Contoman a lot, and uh, that's pretty much the extent of our exercise. <laughs> um, so that's another reason why I want Sweetie Dancing to come back, so I can lose a couple of those pandemic pounds, I think. <laughs> Although normally when we go, we have like, you know, beer and hard cider and french fries, so it's probably not actually <laughs> that much, you know, net loss of calories, but that's okay. It's good exercise. All right, friends, we're down to seven minutes. I feel like I should have like a countdown or something, but I don't know how to do that. That's okay. There we go. I got I got the seconds up on my computer. Thanks to those of you who are sticking it out to the bitter end. I know there's only a couple of you. <laughs> but that's okay. Maybe some people will join us right before midnight. On the East Coast, anyway. Elizabeth, if you're out in California, you've still got a ways to go before your 2020 is over. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know what else to talk about, you guys. Um, when I was organizing my cookbooklets, I realized I have a ton of late 19th century ones which was unexpected. But I'll probably try and digitize some of them and get them up on the website in the new year. <laughs> yes, Elizabeth is counting down to 9 p.m. <laughs> That's all right. Um, what else? Oh, so I can't officially tell you which ones, but yours truly is going to be probably on at least one, if not two, new shows in 2021, which is pretty cool. One of them was supposed to come out this fall, and then the pandemic hit. 
So I got interviewed last winter for one, and then I got interviewed just a couple of weeks ago for another one, which is pretty cool. So you might see me on TV sometime in the future. Um, to this day, I still have people telling me that they saw me on television because the History Channel hit a gold mine with the food that built America. So maybe they'll just keep making more. They should. Food history is fascinating, and there should be way more documentary films than there are. Yes! They will be, Elizabeth. They will be aired nationwide. Um, they are both going to be on cable channels, though. I can't tell you which ones. I signed a contract, but I can't tell you what it is until it's released. Um, but yeah. Yep. Cable. I'll make a giant announcement when it happens. Don't worry. You won't miss it. Um... The one, the one I just did is not really food history. Like, they have one, they have, like, two episodes that I might be in. Um, one specifically about food and then another one about technology. So, um, that one is not, it's a series and it's not, like, strictly food history. But the other one is pretty strictly food history. So, I'm excited about both of them. Well, Elizabeth, they don't want people giving away the game. Although, apparently, the one that I did last year, I was talking to one of the producers, and I was like, don't worry, I won't say anything. It's like, yeah, well, a bunch of people already put it on Twitter. <laughs> but I'm not going to be one of those people. I'm not going to break my contract. And I'm going to be respectful of the agency that asked me to be interviewed. So... I'm sorry, you're going to have to wait. I feel really bad for the one that I did last year because, you know, they did all, like, their talking head interviews first and then they are planning to do a bunch of other work. And then, of course, the pandemic happened, so they weren't able to do any of it. And I hope they're maybe finally starting to get back to it, but they probably won't. So we'll see if it comes out in 2021 even. Who knows? I hope so, but poor television, poor Hollywood, hamstrung like the rest of us. Kind of hard to do acting from home, although, you know, talk shows on SNL have pulled it off pretty well thus far. Uh, oh my gosh, you guys, two minutes, two minutes to mid. As soon as I get off of Food History Happy Hour, we'll stay on. I'll even do a countdown for you because I got my little computer clock up. I hope it's accurate to your clock. It should be. Uh, and then I'm going to go open the door so that well, everything awful from 2020 flies out of my house and the good things fly in. That's the hope anyway. Um, if you have any requests for future Food History Happy Hours, you should tell me. Uh, like I said, January 15th, uh, we're going to be talking about January holidays, which we kind of already did a little bit tonight, but we'll talk about them a little bit more in depth. And also, uh, it's my birthday in January, so I think we'll also talk about the history of birthdays and birthday cake, because that sounds super fun. One minute to go, my friends, <sighs> until we're in a new decade, although there's people that argue about that too. <laughs> Does the decade, decade end with 2020 or start with 2020? Hard to say. Anyway. We're getting there. 20 seconds. I'm going to do the countdown for you. Are you ready? Here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Happy New Year, everybody. Thanks for sticking it out with me, those of you who lasted. Have
have a much better 2021 than 2020, I am going to go open my door to let out everything bad and let in everything good. So I hope you all have a lovely rest of the evening. I'm going to have Christmas tomorrow, which I'm very excited about. Thanks for keeping me company, and we'll see you later in January. All right? Good night, everybody.